There we go. Oh. All right, you see a little red button? That is correct. We are recording. We are recording to the cloud now. There you go. Okay. That's, I'm that's, close the door and that, that'll work. And would, do you want them to leave their microphones up if they have questions? That, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name's Mark Paulison, and uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, I, uh, well, I, I do lizards. And uh, when Pam sent the thing out, I, I thought, well, you know, the thing to do is always thank the people who give you money. So I think I'll start by thanking the faculty uh, council for the FRC grants I've gotten over the years. I, I came to uh, NSU in 2006. So I got uh, two grants in the first few years I was here, uh, one for spatial learning in Oklahoma lizards, another one measuring measurement of the forebrain medial cortex and dorsal cortex in the little brown skink lizards. I'm going to talk about the research that came out of that. And uh, then I shifted gears, and a couple of years ago, I started collaboration with Dr. Cindy Caesar, who, as I'm sure you all know, is our microbiologist and the most recent recipient of the Circle of Excellence Award for research. And we're working on a, a different project now, characterization of the gut microbiota of wild lizards and uh, of research that we're actually in the middle of right now. Come on in. Hey, Ron. Uh, characterization of the gut microbiota of Scalabrus consobrinus. And so I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, Pam used a picture of me with our bearded dragon Zulu on the poster. <laughs> Uh, and that's actually a pretty good picture of Zulu, although perhaps not such a good picture of me. Zulu was our, uh, my, our bearded dragon, our pet, our mascot. Uh, Zulu commonly came down to campus and visited classes where she demonstrated how to be a reptile. <laughs> very commonly came down to recruiting events like River Hawk Rally. There you go. Mm -hmm. Recognize the, uh, the woman in the background, that's soon to be interim Dean Vanessa Anton mm -hmm. from the College of uh, Education. Uh, the young lady in front of her is her granddaughter. You'll notice who is holding the bearded dragon mm -hmm. and who is standing behind, kind of sheepishly grinning. I was kind of hoping Dr. Anton would show up here. I should holler at her across the hall here. Uh, sadly, Zulu passed away last fall, you know, because that happens to all living things. But I wanted her to be remembered in this talk because she was one of the best lizards that we ever knew. What's her life expectancy? She's, she's, they live about 14 years. She was about 13 when she passed away. We actually got her as an adult. She was uh, uh, belonged to a friend of my mother-in-law's. She had yeah, the mother, the, the woman had, had some health problems, having difficulty caring for a lizard, and so we inherited her. And Zulu became a common personality down on our campus, which is why, that's why that picture of me is actually my picture on the, uh, the internet here. So for going close now to five decades, I have been chasing lizards. He's this uh, mouse there. There's the lizard right there. That's a spiny iguana from Mexico. Is that an iguana? Yeah, that's a spiny, spiny tail iguana from Mexico. I, I've been studying lizards because uh, they're a little easier to study than mammals and birds because you can catch them and hold them in your hand and pose them for pictures. <laughs> a little difficult to do with birds. And uh, most lizards are, day, are active in the daytime, so you don't have to go out and trap them like mammals. Some of them are very pretty, like this little juvenile five-line skink. That was a picture taken over at Sequoia State Park, not far from here. Some of them have really unusual shapes. That's a Texas horn lizard from Texas. Uh, commonly known as a horned toad or a horned frog, which is a misnomer because it is neither a toad nor a frog. It is actually a lizard. It does have a toad-like appearance. Uh, some of them are kind of cryptic against their backgrounds. This is a fence lizard from uh, near here that I'll be talking about later in the talk this afternoon. Uh, some of them are big and ferocious looking. This particular lizard is the collared lizard, which, um, come on in. Hey, Renee. Hey. This particular, you got here just in time Perfect. because this lizard here is the collared lizard, which has, holds the distinction of being the state reptile of Oklahoma. A couple of uh, interesting factoids about this. Uh, Oklahoma was the very first state to actually designate a state reptile. So hooray, Oklahoma was number one in something. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, the same legislative session that designated the collared lizard as the state reptile designated the honeybee as the state insect. 
And legend has it that some wag wrote on one of the riders that the state reptile is not allowed to eat the state insect. <laughs> <laughs> a slow day in the legislature that day. Uh, <laughs> this one was taken at Oklahoma Academy of Sciences field trip last fall, and you see it's got a, a big, big, scary mouth, and the little guy in the background is, <laughs> is uh, by the way, you can't see off screen, but about over here, I have my finger in front of it, so it I aims that way, not at my hand there. And this is another, this is an adult male five-line skink. Notice the scars that he has on his head, probably from encounters with other adult males. Anyway, over decades, I've been studying all kinds of aspects of lizards, their diet, uh, their behavior in the wild, how they regulate their body temperature, their reproduction, their territoriality, all sorts of things. And what I'm gonna to talk to you to, about today, sort of kind of a couple of things that fall out fallen out of that uh, work. Now this lovely little animal here is called the Laredo striped whiptail. Uh, it's so named because it was discovered actually within the city limits of, of Laredo, Texas, a corner of Unos Highway 83 and Saltillo Street, by the way, in case you're curious. We want to put a little plaque there the city didn't want to. Uh, and Durrell, during the 1990s, I did a lengthy study of this creature, and the reason is because it's a very unusual lizard and that it's parthenogenetic which means that all of the individuals are female, there are no males, mm. and reproduces without sexual reproduction. These females, that's a female, she lays eggs which develop without being fertilized by sperm, which is a pretty good trick, think yeah. about it. Um, and I was interested how the ecology and the behavior of an all-female species would be different from, from that of a regular species, and so I did a lengthy series of studies down there in the 1990s. And that led to a lot of interesting stuff, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but it did lead to one little observation I wanna mention, which does lead to what I wanna talk about today. These things uh, are common prey for predators, snakes, road runners, other kinds of birds, and of course, herpetologists are out to catch them. When they're being pursued by something, particularly something fast, they run very quickly on the surface of the ground, then they slam on the brakes and dive into a little hole. In fact, Jesus. You can actually see there's the tail drag. Y'all see that broken arrow? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm using the mouse there. Mm -hmm. Kind of handy, actually, rather than using laser pointer. <laughs> and they did that so quickly and so efficiently that it looked for all the world that the lizard knew where that hole was. It didn't look like it was just casting around for a hole. It just, that's where the hole was. It zipped in there so quickly and so deftly that it looked like it knew where the hole was. And the only way it could know where that hole was, of course, is if it had learned where that hole was early. And I saw that several times, and I kind of filed that away for future reference and uh, didn't think about it too much. And then in the year, in the 2000s, I studied another kind of lizard. This creature here is called the Mediterranean gecko. As the name implies, it's not native to the U.S. It's native to the Mediterranean region. It was introduced to the U.S. in the early uh, 20th century, and it's in through most of the southern states. It's not, it's common in Oklahoma, by the way. It's all over the campus at OU and uh, UCO. Not seen it here, but uh, they are nocturnal. They're active at night, and they crawl around on buildings. And uh, because I was at McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana at the time, and there was a big population of this lizard literally on the campus, I mean, how convenient is that? The animal that you're studying is literally on the building you have your office in. Uh, I and some colleagues uh, did a lengthy study of these things. And when I tried to catch those, what you do is you go out at night with a flashlight, you find a building where they are, and you chase them around. And when you chase these things, they also run very quickly, in this case, on the surface of a building here. And then they dive into a hole that, for the life of you, you didn't know was there, but the gecko did. And so once again, here's another lizard that runs really fast directly to a hole that it can only know the location of if it had already learned it. And so I thought, well, now wait a minute. This is a completely different lizard than, than the Laredo whiptail. They're living in totally different habitats, and both of them at least look like they have learned the location of their bolt holes. So I asked the obvious question, can lizards learn? And uh, I did what any scientist would do. I went to the literature and to actually find out if anybody would actually looked into this. And what I found was not much. I found was statements like this. Reptiles are, quote, instinctive, possess a meager behavioral repertoire, and at best, 
and are at best capable of only minimal amounts of learning. It's from Gordon Burkhart in 1977, and Bayer Kratstrom in the next year said, reptiles would generally be considered to have less complex behavior than other vertebrates. By the way, Burkhart and Kratstrom are herpetologists, not mammologists or ornithologists, so this is not bias on their part. So I go, well, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right, because it sure looks like they're act, they act like they've learned where those bolt holes are, but these things are telling me that can't learn. So I went into the articles that Burghardt and Bradstrom and others cited, and it was pretty obvious that there were some problems with the laboratory studies of lizard learning. One was inappropriate temperatures. You know, psychologists like labs at about 72 degrees, which is also a good temperature for pigeons and for white mice and rats. That's too cold for lizards. And so a lot of times we think lizards just weren't active because it was too cold for them. The other thing is inappropriate awards. Now, now bear with me here. This is a simple t-test here where you have a test animal down here and a food reward up here. What the test animal has to do is run up this track and decide whether to go to the left or to the right to get to the food reward. Okay, very simple teammates. You do this with a mouse and it very quickly learns to go to take the correct turn to get to the food reward because mice are always hungry and so they'll always you know, very quickly learn which way to turn to get to the food. Lizards, on the other hand, have a much lower metabolic rate. They don't eat nearly as much. And so after a lizard does this maybe twice, it's got all the food it needs for the day, and it's ready to go to bed. <laughs> so after just a couple of trials, it's not going to move at all, much less go down that maze because it doesn't need to. And the people who studied lizards, I don't think were really properly aware of that when they did their studies that concluded lizards can't learn. Now, on the other hand, what I was looking at in nature was escape behavior. I mean, now escape behavior is a different thing. Animals have to get away from the predators. So natural selection should strongly favor individuals that can learn the location of an escape retreat. I mean, consider this. Two lizards, one which knows where the closest bolt, bolt hole is, and one which hasn't learned where the closest bolt hole is. Both of them are being chased by a roadrunner or a snake. Which one is more likely to get away? obviously the one that's learned that location. Mm -hmm. So I decided to do a study of lizards with proper temperatures and instead of using food rewards, using fake behaviors. Now the lizard I chose was this little creature here, the little brown skink. And she, this is actually an adult. That's an American quarter there. So that's an adult lizard. That's how big they are. Uh, you probably, I don't know if you've ever seen them around here. If you, if you have trees in your yard with oak leaves, they probably are in there. These things live in forests, and when you encounter them, they're on the surface of the leaf litter. When you, when you chase them, they'll run a short distance and dive under a rock or dive under a log or some other cover object. Again, they give you the impression that they know exactly where they're going, that they've learned the location of the escape retreat. So, I did a little experimental setup. Uh, this is a 72-gallon aquarium, so this is about three feet across from there to there. I have two little retreats, 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cardboard retreats. Okay. And I put the lizard in the center of the tank. That's a plastic cup with the bottom cut out under this heat lamp. And I left it there for 90 seconds so the lizard could actually warm up to the right temperature. Because even though it was 72 in the room, we want the lizard to be warmer than that. And then I lift the cup and then I chase the lizard with a Q-tip tapping the base of the lizard's tail, not directing it in any direction, just trying to get it to run, until it escapes under one of these retreats. At which point I leave it undisturbed for five minutes to reinforce the fact that, okay, you've gotten away. If the lizard failed to run under a retreat, it's chased for 90 seconds, then I catch it and physically place it under the retreat and leave it undisturbed for five minutes so it is being forced to learn what that retreat is. I did a total of eight trials, trials one to four on day one, trials five to eight on 48 hours later. And frankly, that had more to do with my teaching schedule at the time than any experimental protocol. I turned the substrate between trials to eliminate odors because I didn't want that to be biasing results. And each lizard had a rest period of at least 40 minutes between trials to allow them to recover from being chased around. And the rationale goes like this. If a lizard can learn to escape to the retreat, the time it takes to reach that retreat should decline from trials one day. So trial one, it hasn't learned yet, so it probably will run the whole 90 seconds. 
by trial two, it will have learned, maybe, trial three and four. And by trial six, seven, and eight, it should have learned to escape under the retreat and so should get there very quickly. And when you do this with a bunch of lizards, you get lots of interesting results. So for example, this is the tracing for one particular lizard, apparently 05-3. This one obviously figured it out. After, you know, the first couple of trials, it was doing it quicker. And by trials six, seven, and eight, when I chased it, it ran immediately under the retreat. So that one clearly learned. On the other hand, <laughs> you can sometimes get lizards that just refuse to learn anything. Kind of like our students, isn't it? <laughs> so you do get some like that, so who just just don't look, just don't get it. Okay, so experiment one: Can little brown skinks learn to escape to one particular correct retreat? And what that means is that before the first trial, one of the retreats was designated as a correct one. That just I <laughs> flip, and I chased the lizard until it escaped under the correct retreat. And if for some reason, if it land under, uh, ran under the incorrect retreat, that retreat was lifted up and I resumed chasing the lizard until it ran under the correct one or 90 seconds. Okay. And I should point out that this experiment here was done while I was still at McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana. So this experiment was done on lizards that I caught in Louisiana. That's important for the little later on. And the results were using repeated measures analysis of variance. Uh, no. Very, I mean, it's, it's sort of kind of maybe downward, but the p-value is above the magic 0.05, and so they didn't get better uh, getting to the escape retreat, and so they didn't learn to escape to the correct retreat, which is, again, completely backwards from what I expected because the lizards I saw in the real world looked like, looked like they were doing it, and here in the lab, no good. So, okay, what's going on? Well, I think what's going on is this. The little brown skink has a very small home range. This is just a picture I took and mm -hmm. I doctored up of the lines. It has a small home range of just a couple of hundred square feet. Now, on an average day, that little skink will crisscross its home range several times. The process of crisscrossing its home range like this, it will get some, what the scientists refer to as non-specific information about the locations of things in its home range. And uh, if you look at the literature on mice running mazes, if you take a mouse and put it in a maze without any reward, just let it wander around, and then put it in the maze and test it, mice that have had the previous non-specific experience learn quicker. But in the real world, lizards are, have small home ranges, and so spend time getting this non-specific experience. Maybe that's necessary for them to actually learn where escape retreats are. So I did a second experiment. Prior experience in the, quote, habitat improved little brown skink learning to escape to one particular correct retreat. And same sort of experiment, but in this case, I put the little brown skink in the test chamber, the habitat, for 48 hours prior to testing, and the lizard was just left alone. It could wander anywhere in the tank that it wants under either retreat. It had food and water available. Those were removed during testing because I don't want that to interfere. And then I retested them. And what I found was, yes, lizards with prior experience, with repeated measures analysis variants, can show significant improvement in getting to the escape retreat. I mean, it's kind of interesting. There's this big drop here, and that kind of levels off, and then a big drop there. But it is statistically significant. And so the first interesting thing that I've learned about lizards is that little brown skinks can learn to escape to a particular tree, retreat, but only if they've had prior experience with the habitat. Don't give them prior experience. The lizards that I've studied can't. Okay? Are we with you so far? <laughs> All right. I, I actually wound up, uh, it was about this time when I was finishing up this experiment that I actually moved to Northeastern State University, a, a new home. And the nice thing about moving here is that the little brown skink is very common right around here. I occasionally find it on campus, but it's certainly common at Sparrowhawk Primitive Area and Sequoia State Park. So. So the same species occurs here as it did in Louisiana. So I thought, okay, I'm going to continue my um, spatial learning studies. Uh, I've got an FRC grant to continue spatial learning studies. And the first thing I did is, well, you know, I probably ought to make sure the Oklahoma lizards are the same as the Louisiana lizards, because if I don't and I publish something, some guy's going to say, well, how do you know the Oklahoma lizards are not the same as Louisiana? 
So, okay, fine. I repeated experiment one, and little brown skinks learn to escape to one particular correct retreat, or Oklahoma lizards. And again, this is the ones where they didn't have prior experience. And remember the Louisiana lizards, the answer was no. Imagine my surprise when I got these results. The Oklahoma lizards, even without prior experience, could learn to escape their particular retreat. That's why I have yes, question mark, exclamation point, huh? And here are the two figures together. The light squares are the Louisiana lizards. The black squares are the Oklahoma lizards. And you see there's a very, a very significant difference between them, even as early as trials three and four. For those of you who like statistics, here are the numbers. Trials one to four for Louisiana, always very high. Trials one to four and one to eight for Oklahoma, very, very low. So I took a look at this again and looked at some other metrics. Uh, for example, the mean number of trials lizards escaped to the correct retreat. Remember, there were eight trials. The Oklahoma lizards did it on average almost five and a half out of the eight trials. The Louisiana lizards only 3.3, less than half. That difference was statistically significant. The mean number of trials the lizards escaped to the correct retreat within 35 seconds. Again, the Oklahoma lizards were much better than the Louisiana lizards. The difference nearly uh, narrowly reached, failed to reach statistical significance. And then remember, there were some lizards who just didn't get to a retreat. The Louisiana lizards did that in, in almost in more than twice as many trials as the Oklahoma lizards. <coughs> yeah, the Oklahoma lizards are doing better. <laughs> now, to, for publication, uh, the people who do this kind of research like to have things called learning criteria. And the learning criterion I use is uh, a, a lizard escaped under the correct retreat within 35 seconds. In at least two trials after the first trial, it was scored as, yes, did meet the learning criterion. If it didn't do that, didn't make it into the correct retreat within 35 seconds after the first trial, it was considered as not meeting the learning criterion. And here are the numbers, only eight, only four of the eight Louisiana lizards met the learning criterion, whereas 12 of the 15 Oklahoma lizards did. And again, the difference is statistically significant. So this was a really big deal. The Oklahoma lizards did much better than the Louisiana lizards. And this is such a big deal. <laughs> I published on this and pointing out that this is one of the very first examples of geographic variation in the ability of animals to learn. Yeah. You look in the literature, the number of cases of that happening is, is, can be counted on one hand. There's about three studies with fish, one with birds. This study was the very first one ever to show this in a reptile. And so a second interesting thing I learned is geographic variation in spatial learning with skate behavior occurs in little brown skinks. The Oklahoma lizards are much better at doing this than the Louisiana lizards. Yeah. So when I published that, I dutifully acknowledged the Faculty Research Council grant that helped me discover this completely unexpected result. That's why you do research, right? To find things like that. All right, so since that happens, the next question is, well, why? Why are the Oklahoma lizards better than the Louisiana ones? And when you study behavior, it kind of breaks down into nature nurture. Perhaps the Oklahoma individuals or individuals from different populations have different cognitive abilities. Maybe the Oklahoma lizards are just quote unquote smarter. The other possibility is they're exposed to different environmental conditions. Maybe there's something about the environment in Oklahoma that lizards here are better able to learn to crawl under little cardboard retreats. Well, I actually was interested in this first one right here because one of my jobs here is to teach human anatomy. And uh, in fact, after this is over, I'm gonna go over to the anatomy room and dissect on the cadaver, by the way. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things we talk about is the brain, and one of the parts of the brain we talk about is the hippocampus. And studies of birds have shown that bird species that are better at spatial learning have larger hippocampuses than bird species that aren't so good at spatial learning. And apparently a similar kind of thing has been found in voles, which is a type of small rodent. All right, so the obvious hypothesis may be the Oklahoma lizards have larger hippocampuses than Louisiana lizards. Hmm. There was just one problem with that. Lizard brains don't have hippocampuses. 
Uh, they do, however, have another part of the brain that's thought to be homologous to the hippocampus. It's called the dorsal and medial cortex of the brain. Now, I wrote, I originally wrote a grant to go to Louisiana and bring some lizards back, and that grant wasn't funded. But I got an FRC grant to do a similar kind of study just looking at Oklahoma lizards, because remember, some of them could, most of them could learn, but a few of them could. And so I thought, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll get the Oklahoma lizards, I'll get the ones that do learn, the ones that don't learn, and measure their brains. Well, how do you measure the brain of a lizard? Well, the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation over in Oklahoma City has this machine here. That's a small animal MRI machine. They use it to measure the brain and other organs of mice and rats, and they've actually measured the brains of things as small as honeybees. Hmm. So I called them up and said, you know, lizards, and they said, huh? And I told them what they want to do, and they said, that's great, come on over. So I wrote up an FRC grant, and I got a bunch of lizards, and we did the spatial learning trials. Some of them dutifully were able to learn, some of them were not. And I bring the live lizards over there. Now, to put a lizard in an MRI, you first have to anesthetize it. So this is a little brown skin, a plastic box. That's a tube that's, that's spewing isofluorine gas into that little box. I got to tell you, this was kind of an issue because the people at OMRF really know exactly how much gas to use on a mouse. I mean, to the, to the tenth of a milligram. But they've never worked on lizards. And these lizards have this bad habit of holding their breath. So they're all knocked out, and you take them out, they're not knocked out, so put them back in there. And so we had to kind of make things up as we went along. Uh, we eventually more or less got it figured out. And then when you get a lizard knocked out, this is the knocked out lizard, you put in this little cradle here. That's a little mass that actually, the, the, the head of the lizard's in that little mask, or is pushed into that little mask to actually keep it breathing isofluorine while it's in the MRI machine, because the last thing you want is for that thing to wake up and start crawling around inside the bazillion dollar MRI machine. <laughs> and then you get Debbie Saunders to load it into the MRI machine and hope that the lizard doesn't wake up while you're doing the MRI. Uh, I will tell you that uh, the isofluorine did work pretty good, Will. Almost all the lizards recovered. A few of them sadly did not. One particular one recovered and immediately laid an egg. <laughs> which was the very first time an egg was laid in the small animal MRI facility. Probably the last time, too, unless somebody else has, has uh, done uh, lizard work there. And so you get an image that looks like that. That is a lizard brain. Well, sort of a lizard brain. You're looking down on the top of the lizard. That's an eye. You see the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cursor? Yeah. Broken arrow, Nathan? Yes. Okay. This is the olfactory bulb, the olfactory tract. Here's the brain itself, the forebrain. Here's the midbrain. There's the cerebellum, the dula oblongata. There's the spinal cord. But we were really interested in making sections this way, like this. So from the front to the back, here's the front. That's the olfactory bulbs, <coughs> the olfactory tracts. Look how big the eyes are compared to the brain right there. Hmm. Back of the eye now. Now we're getting to the forebrain. That's the uh, jaw right there, incidentally, or the, the, the mouth. This is the trigeminal nerve, by the way, cranial nerve number five. Goes to, among other things, the lower jaw. The further back, here you're seeing the ventricles of the cerebellum. The further back, um, the blood vessels, I think, is what we figured out as those were. Okay, and that's the spinal cord right there. And it turns out this is the section that we want. And it turns out that NSF, I'm sorry, NIH has a program you can download, Image J, if you're familiar with it, where you can measure this cross-sectional area. That's the area that's homologous to the hippocampus of mammals and birds. And when we did that, we found that the ones, the lizards that did meet the learning criterion did have slightly larger brains, but not very much larger, and the difference was not statistically significant. So after all of that work, it turns out there was no relation between the forebrain cross-sectional area and the learning measures, um, which suggests, at least at the level of resolution that we can get from this MRI machine, which suggests that perhaps it's the different environmental conditions the lizards are exposed to matter here. Specific, I'm sorry. Sorry, what was your sample size for this? Uh, there was, let me see, miss, um, 10 of these and eight of those, if I remember correctly. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. Uh, it 
probably means that individuals are exposed to different environmental conditions. Oklahoma, particularly this part of Oklahoma, has lots of rocks. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> the lizard, a rock, probably looks a lot like a little cardboard retreat. In Louisiana, where I was, these things, there, there weren't flat rocks around. So maybe the Oklahoma lizard's living in an environment with lots of flat things that are able to learn to run under lots of flat things. And that's why I did that. Uh, I have, you know, there's a lot more to tell you about spatial learning, but I want to go ahead and get on to the other, the more recent research that Dr. Caesar and I have been doing. Uh, here I've got a picture from the internet of probiotics, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Probiotics are pills that you can take that contain billions of bacterial and other microorganisms. You swallow those, those organisms go into your digestive system and they do all kinds of wonderful things for you. Um, maintains digestive health, reduces systemic impact. Uh, inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. Those microorganisms are collectively referred to as gut microbiota, and they live in the intestines of vertebrate animals. And they benefit the host by breaking down molecules in your food, by producing vitamins that the host can absorb, and probably not sufficiently uh, understood, they cry out harmful things that keep you from getting sick. Well, uh, Dr. Caesar and I uh, we went out one night with a seminar speaker who was talking about gut microbes, and we got to talking about kinds of things that we work on, and we got to talk about gut microbes, and it turns out that mammals, including ourselves, of course, have gut microbes. We eat many times a day, and most mammals eat every day of the year, and so the microbes in their gut get a constant food supply. Reptiles, on the other hand, such as the lizards that I study, they eat only once or twice a day, and they frequently miss eating, like a day like this when it's cloudy, they're not going to be out eating. And they don't eat for several months of the year while lying dormant in hibernation. Here in Oklahoma, from about Halloween to Easter, lizards are not active. They're in hibernation, which means they're not eating, which means the gut microbiota that they have, if they have it, aren't eating either. And so Cindy and I wondered, what happens to the gut microbiota of those lizards when they're hibernating? And so we looked in the literature and to see if anybody's looked at that. And what we found is, no, nobody's looked at that. In fact, what we found is nobody's really looked at gut microbiota of lizards, period. Uh, there was one old study done in Germany at a zoo where they found that they, they sliced open some lizards and swabbed their guts and found that they had intestine, that gut microbiota. But, you know, that's zoo animals, so... So we wrote an FRC grant to say, okay, we're going to answer this question here, what happens to their gut microbiota, but the first thing is we want to figure out if they have gut microbiota to begin with. So we wrote an FRC grant a couple of years ago, which was called essentially, do, do lizards around here have gut microbiota? And uh, we did some preliminary studies of several species, and we found this particular species, the fence lizard, Scalopterus consobrinus, is our best candidate. It's real common, they're real abundant around here. Their diet is well known. They eat insects and spiders and other arthropods. And they're large enough to study those little brown skinks that we were studying before. They're kind of small to, to put a swab in, but these guys are big enough. And the methods are, uh, we catch lizards. I swab their cloaca, which means I take a little tiny swab, put it in the vent. The cloaca is the common exit point of the digestive, rest, not respiratory, digestive, yeah, I, I study anatomy. <laughs> reproductive and urinary system. In other words, uh, urine, feces, and at the right time of year, eggs and sperm go through the cloaca. And so feces, obviously, are the ones that we're interested in. So we'd stick a little swab into the cloaca to get some feces. Uh, once we get the fecal sample, uh, Cindy and her students use a DNA extraction technique that basically is, I give it to Cindy and her students and they extract the DNA, so don't ask me how that works. You'll have to ask her. And the DNA that they extract is microbial DNA. The kit that they have is specific to getting DNA from bacteria. And if we get a large enough sample, we freeze it, we send it off for gene sequencing and day processing to this lab in Lubbock, Texas. What they do is they take the bacterial DNA, they compare it to their library of DNA of different bacteria, and they tell us what kind of bacteria the lizard has. <coughs> okay? And what we found, okay, yes, lizards do have gut microbiota. In fact, they have lots of different kinds of gut microbiota. This is a sample from just the first uh, 18 lizards, I think it is. And there's 11 different phyla of bacteria present, which is just ridiculous. That's a huge number of different kinds of bacteria for such a small group of lizards. 
In this chart here, each bar represents a different lizard, and each color represents the amount of a different kind of bacterium. And the main thing to look at that is no two lizards are the same. Look how different they are. This one's got a lot of that green one. This one's got a lot of the, uh, the orange one, which is uh, this Dinococcus thermos. Now, there were a lot of them that says no hit or unclassified. That apparently means bacteria that uh, RTL didn't have in their data bank. So when you take those out and just look at the ones that they do have classified, we still have a tremendous amount of variation. No two lizards are the same. No two lizards are even close to the same. Hmm. Kind of brings us to the next interesting thing here is when we look at down at the genera, there's almost 200 different genera of bacteria have been identified, which is obscene. You don't, I mean, I don't think you do have that many in you, but you're a lot bigger than average lizard. The only genus that was present in every lizard was Salmonella, which is not too surprising because Salmonella is a soil bacterium. But even it ranged from 0.3% of all the bacteria to 95% of the bacteria in the lizard gut. And some of these other serratias, 0 to 80%, Cornwall bacterium, 0 to 56, Citrobacter, 0 to 50. So it's at the level of the genus, it's incredibly variable. And so another interesting thing I've learned is fence lizards do have bacteria in their gut, but there's tremendous variability between individual lizards. And so the interesting question is, why? And sort of the obvious first hypothesis is maybe it has to do with the diet. I mean, these things all eat insects and other arthropods, but chances are no two lizards are eating exactly the same insects. You know, one may eat a grasshopper one day and a spider the next day, and then while a, a second one is eating a caterpillar two days in a row, and then misses a day and then eats a pill bug. And so we wondered if perhaps uh, the diet was actually responsible for this, and so we put together another FRC grant, the one that was just funded last year, to actually test the diet hypothesis. And what we've done is we've captured some fence lizards and we swapped them. And then it's turning, instead of turning them loose, we hold them in captivity and feed them a standard diet of crickets. Every single lizard gets crickets from just our cricket stock. And then we swab them again a week later and then feed them crickets. And then swab them again another week later and feed them crickets. And if diet is important, we would expect that the diversity of bacteria would slowly decrease and all the lizards would have at least similar microbes in their guts. Hmm. And the results are still to come because we don't know yet. <laughs> ah, they have to invite me back. <laughs> still in the process of doing it. We have some data from 2017. We uh, have more data coming from this year. The reason we don't have much data from 2017 is because, you know, the FRC funds in July, right? Okay, so we couldn't start doing this until July. Here's another interesting thing that we found out. We are much more likely to obtain microbial DNA from guts of fence lizards that are caught in the spring than from fence lizards caught in the fall. In other words, when we catch fence lizards in August, September, or October, like you know, last, last, last fall, only about 25% of them have enough gut microbes, enough gut microbes in there that we can get their DNA, 75% don't. Whereas lizards caught in April, May, June in the spring, slightly more than half of them will have gut microbiota sufficiently uh, abundant that we can get a sample, and half of them don't. And that difference turns out to be statistically significant as well. And so while we do have a little bit of data from last fall, we're basically waiting for the weather to get warm for April, May, and June of this year to actually get more lizards to see if, in fact, um, the diet actually does cause the, the gut microbes to converge. By the way, it's kind of an interesting question. Why do they? Why do we have so much better luck in spring and fall? It's the same person catching the lizards. I'm the one doing the swabbing. I always do it with my right hand holding the lizard in the left hand. Uh, we think that perhaps in the spring when the lizards come out, they're really hungry, they eat a lot. And so whatever gut microbiota they have just quickly regenerates itself. And so there's lots, we have a better chance of getting it. Whereas in the fall, the lizards are still active, but not as active. They're not eating as much, and maybe the gut microbiota are starting to wind down. I don't know. 
in, in the last couple of minutes, I do want to point out uh, this other last thing here, which isn't funded from an FRC grant, but it's still kind of fun. Even the smallest and gentlest of Oklahoma lizards can be vicious. Now, we're not talking about that collared lizard I showed you before. We're talking about this character here, the little brown skink. Remember it from the spatial learning ones? This is, again, an adult little brown skink next to an American penny. And this actually video here comes from, and hopefully it'll work. Okay. This video actually comes from an honor thesis done by Laura Myers, who you may know here in the College of Education. She graduated from here a couple of years ago, but she did an honors thesis with me. She was interested in studying the uh, uh, behavioral interactions of little brown skinks. This is a 10 gallon aquarium right here. And she initially had a partition down the middle with a lizard on one side and the lizard on another, a different lizard on the other side where they couldn't interact with each other. Left them for 48 hours, then removed the partition, put a single retreat in the middle, <laughs> and then left the room and let the video camera record what happened. Now, little brown skinks, when you catch them, they never bite, they're, they're not vicious or anything, but look what happened. Now, when you watch behavioral tra tapes of lizards, there's a lot of waiting, sitting around waiting for them to do something. <laughs> but just bear with me here. The partition is gone. The partition is gone. They work, they work separated, and now they're allowed to interact. <laughs> We think that tail action is another is another threat display. So they're still deciding who's who's the big lizard, who's the submissive. And now I think we have a winner. <laughs> uh, when Laura showed me this, she said, I didn't know they did this. And, and I said, you know, I've been chasing these things for 40 years, and I didn't know they did this either. And so this, this, publica this publication was uh, the first to actually talk about that. Unless you think it's just little brown skinks, this is a hatchling of the five-line skink. That's all of about an inch and a half long altogether. I had another honor student, Devin Moran, who's now uh, in the optometry school. She did an honors thesis. Same sort of thing. Bear with me here. Same tank. Once again, they started out being partitioned, and now they're allowed to interact. This is called tail wiggling behavior. Perhaps because they're hatchlings, a lot of times they didn't pay any attention to each other. So this is no reaction. So how old would they be about this point in time? At this point in time, uh, less than a month old. Okay. I have to look it up. It probably you start seeing in the beginning of July. Are this, they fully grown? Oh no, no, no. Okay. These these are these are you know they've babies basically been out out of their eggs for just a few weeks. You know how quickly they grow. Not quite as violent as the little brown skinks, but yeah, watch this. They're, they're over here. We think in these, in these juvenile five-line skinks, tail wiggling isn't a threat display. It's actually a submissive display. Hmm. Because when, we, when we actually scored, it's the, it's the subdominant, the submissive animal that did it far more often. So. so that's just a few of the interesting things that I've learned about lizards. I'd like to acknowledge, well, tap at the hips, as some of you may know, that's my wife. We actually met over the Mediterranean gecko study. And here at NSU, uh, Alejandra, Robbie, Becca, Becca Gleason, who's uh, involved, and Ben Harris are currently working on the lizard microbe study. Brian Becker, Jordan Johnson, Emily DeMoss. And I thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. so, I hope that wasn't too boring. Did we lose Nathan? There's Nathan. No, we've had no I'm still here. Oh, yeah, there's Nathan, there's Mark. And I have a question for you. Sure. Your, your MRI studies, did you notice a, a difference or? 
I assume that not all little brown skinks are the same weight. So did you take a, uh, was there a difference in the size of their brains in that particular region based on their uh, accounting for their body size? Um, I, I rerun the analysis doing analysis of covariance using the size of the lizard, you still get no difference. Hmm. So there, I mean, yes, there are some that are a little bigger than others, but the, the, it doesn't, doesn't cause a difference in the size of the forebrain. It seems like a difficult, I, I was excited to see the MRI studies because I was hoping, you know, oh, there's that one thing that causes them to behave differently. But yeah, it's always it nice when that happens. <laughs> I, I suspect there probably is something there, but even their machine, it's designed for rats and mice, not lizards. Hmm. So there, it might take something a little bit more <laughs> specific, which sadly would probably involve dissection and slicing of the lizards. You just don't like to do that. It was worth a shot. It was great. They had a lot of fun doing it, by the way. I remember when I brought the lizard in, Debbie Saunders, the tech says, where are the brains in these things? <laughs> well, I think they're in the head. <laughs> well, Mark, I, I know Cindy's probably thought about this, too. You know, with human beings, you know, we have categorized the gut microbiota with you know, saying that everybody's just like you have a blood type, you have a microbiota type. Mm -hmm. We'll find that out with humans now. Are you able, just curious, would it be feasible to have the lizards that you are checking with the microbiota actually lay eggs, let them hatch, and then start looking to see when they acquire their microbiota, you know, and have, you know, batch A, batch B, you know, feed crickets or da 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 to see if they, you know, when they acquire their microbiota and is it specific, you know, like a type like we see in humans? That's a good question, and it's, it's something you actually we can't do in the fall because they don't breed in the fall, yeah. but they do breed in the spring. And yeah. so, you know, we catch both males and females. Now, you're introducing a complex thing when you have males and females mate because they mate through the cloaca, so it's possible that they could exchange microbiota that way. So there's that issue. Yeah. It would be interesting to get, you know, male and female lizard character their eyes, their microbiota, get a batch of eggs and get the little ones. Now, the interesting thing about lizards, of course, they don't have parental care. Yeah. So, you know, it's another question, where do the little ones even get their microbiota? Do they get them in the egg, or do they get them from the surface of the egg, or do they just get them from the surrounding soil, or do they get them from the first little insects or spiders that they eat? And the answer is, yeah. I do know there is one interesting study that's been done on iguanas. Now, iguanas are vegetarians and are well known to have uh, gut microbiota that's kind of specific to vegetarians, hatchling iguanas will intentionally consume the feces of adult iguanas. And apparently that's how they get their gut microbes. Hmm. So now whether hatchling fence lizards do that, I, I, have, I know of no, no study that's actually said fence lizards consume the feces of adult fence lizards. That would be something to find out. Hmm. It sounds disgusting, but it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Do fecal bacteria to, 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 to hatchling humans? <laughs> no, to humans. No. I mean, to me, it doesn't, I mean, that doesn't sound bad. I mean, considering we do fecal transplants now with people that would have C. difficile infections or really bad GI type infections. We do that now. So <laughs> to me, it's kind of part of treatment. Well, yeah, you know, with human beings, and of course, now the thing about it, humans are also at least partially vegetarian, more or less, whereas these fence lizards are all carnivorous. They eat very little, if any, vegetation. Mm -hmm. And that also may have something to do with this. Um, the, the, and by the way, the, the bacteria that we find in the fence lizard is not, well, there are some similarities, but it's kind of different than the ones you find in the vegetarian iguanas which is not too big a surprise because the iguanas bacteria is helping the iguanas break down their vegetation, uh, vegetable diet. Mm -hmm. It's not an issue for the uh, fence lizards. It would really be interesting to sort of get this figured out enough and then study a lizard that's actually partly vegetarian and partly <laughs> carnivorous and see, see if its bacteria swing back and forth or something like that. Mm. We're a ways from there yet. <laughs> Mark, I got another question for you. As a as a prodigious lizard hunter, as a young man, 
<laughs> I know that some lizards are easier to catch than others. Is it possible that you, uh, there, there seems like another variable here that is you. Is it possible that when you were in Louisiana, you weren't as good at catching lizards as you are when you got to Oklahoma? <laughs> so you caught lizards that can hide better when you got here? Uh, I suppose that's possible, although, you know, when I go out in the field, it's, it's, uh, I, 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 you know, I actually do have the data. When I go out to the field, I write down how many lizards I see and how many lizards I catch. Hmm. I suppose I could look and see if there's any big difference in the percentage. My, my sort of gut reaction is, no, I, it wasn't any different. It's, it seems to be more matter. Some days I'm, I'm absolutely stupendous. I catch every lizard I see, both in Louisiana here. Other days, I can't go to the field and catch a cold. <laughs> so I think there's, uh, I suppose it is a possibility. I should, really should check into it, but I kind of doubt it. You know, one thing I do, I, I <coughs> did do, uh, lizards that have, as you may know, when you catch a lizard by the tail, the tail breaks off. Mm -hmm. Don't use lizards that I've broken the tails off of because that adds another variable. Mm -hmm. Even though technically the tail does, you know, it's not attached to the brain. That, that's a lizard that's had a predatory encounter different from simply being caught. So, you know, uh, uh, Mark Tozio, one of the things that that interests me quite a bit in your study is the is the aggression component. Mm -hmm. And you know, have you have you pursued studying that part of it? Well. Um, Laura's study uh, used both male and female skin cell, little, little, little brown skinks. Mm. We managed to get enough data for, for the males that we actually have published on that. We didn't get enough data for females. Part of the reason is because some of the females that we had were gravid. They had eggs, and that causes them to be much less active than they would be normal. And so in answer to your question, I, I hope to pursue this study even more to see if females are as aggressive. And then the other thing is, uh, and I have a long-standing interest in juveniles, because uh, here on this campus, for example, in in July, little uh, the, the little five-line skinks, they're everywhere. You can, I mean, they're on Bagley Hall. I don't know if you've ever. They're on they're 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 on this little walkway back here, and they're you know you can't walk five feet without seeing three of them. And so when the little lizards hatch out, there's a very short period of time where there's a whole bunch of them. And not a lot of space and a lot of lot, not a lot of food for them, so that suggests that there's going to be some sort of competition between them. Mm. Now we know that there actually is some behavioral interactions between them. They actually do lunge at each other and they do signal each other. What's interesting that study of the the, the five line skink, even though they will lunge at each other and run away from each other, at the end of the day they will they will sit next to each other under the retreat. So they'll oh. share the retreat, but not share space above ground. Oh. The, the little brown skinks, they don't share anything. <laughs> one of them's under a retreat, the other one walks in, there's a fight. So oh. it's, 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 it's kind of a complicated thing. It's, it, it does seem to matter, age and sex seems to matter. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in pursuing that this summer and uh, trying to get another honor student to take a look at that as well. It's kind of fun to do. You catch the lizards, you, you record them, and then you look at the recordings at your leisure during the fall. And then a student comes into your office, did you see this? Did you see this? That's always fun. <laughs> Very good. Any other questions? Let's see, Pam, where are you? Yes. What was your question? Uh, I'm trying to get. Uh, Can I mute her? No. I'm trying to get Pam back. Pam, say something. Hi, I am here. And the, the, there you are. There we go. There you go. I just wanted to say thank you very much for uh, putting together this series. Uh, I uh, was really intrigued about it because. Uh, I don't get a chance to talk about my, my little guys in front of uh, other people, other people who aren't herpetologists very often, and they are a fun group of animals to work with. So thank you very much for uh, in sending out the invitation, and I'd like to do it again sometime. Definitely. Yeah. I'd like to have you and Dr. Cesar come back maybe and, and share a, a little bit more once you have more data on the gut microbiology. Mm -hmm. 
So it's a very yeah, interesting. Cliffhanger. Now you have a cliffhanger. <laughs> I know, I know. I'd much rather listen to you talk about herbs than, than mammals or, or birds, but that's just me. <laughs> Well, I thanks for zooming the the session. Also, it, I oh, yeah. I'm not sure I would have gotten in the car and driven to tell <laughs> to to see this, but but I certainly appreciate it being on Zoom. Wonderful. Well, we were glad you were able to join us. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And y'all have a good day. Thank you. Pamela, do you have off the top of your head when the next one is? April 17th at 3 o'clock, and, and it will be uh, Dr. Farina King. She will be speaking about DNA boarding schools. Awesome. By the way, don't forget, Undergraduate Research Day, April 24th. Applications are due by your students this week. This week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I was really. Uh, Dine Bordi, uh, Navajo Boarding Schools. Yeah, that'd be Farina King. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.